Good morning and evening for those joining us uh, from Asia and good afternoon for um, our friends in Europe. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Berkshire Miller and I am Director and Senior Fellow of the Indo-Pacific Program at the McDonnell Laurie Institute. I am delighted to be your moderator for what I'm sure will be a superb discussion on a crucially important region for Canada. For much of the last five years, global disruptions have led to disarray and disorder, placing the international order under tremendous stress. The return of great power competition and multipolarity, the emergence of populism and nationalism, coupled of course with the global pandemic, has resulted in vast economic upheavals and served as catalysts for new global realignments. In light of this, the McDonnell Laurie Institute, with generous support from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Foundation in Germany, has launched a series of strategic dialogues and public discussions on key areas of global re realignment for Canada and its like-minded partners. This project will look to define the critical changes and challenges to the international order and how we can protect and promote our shared values and interests. One of the key areas of global realignment, of course, is in the Indo-Pacific. As many of you will know, the McDonnell Laurie Institute has been placing a good bit of attention and importance to this critical region in recent months. Over the past year, we've hosted events and given a platform to key thought leaders across the region, highlighting the key stakes and outlining the imperative for Canada to both bolster its own engagement. This session will be an excellent opportunity to survey a range of uh, experts across the region and explore intersections and synergies with Canada. Today, we have a fantastic cast of experts uh, from all over the world. We have speakers today from Paris, London, Washington, DC, Tokyo, Singapore, and of course, Ottawa. This discussion is all the more timely for Canada as we continue to develop our own strategy for the Indo-Pacific region to ensure that our interests are unapologetically driven forward and opportunities in the region are not lost. This is a topic I'm sure we will get into more as the day evolves. Uh, so, uh, with that being noted, there's a lot to, to, to uh, dive into on Canada and its own approach to this region, but I'd like to get started with our, with our panel, and then we can get into more of that discussion during the moderated period. So, for our first speaker, I'm going to go to the, uh, uh, the one who's the, the furthest away and has the, the late shift uh, today, uh, Dr. Uh, Frederick Kaleem, uh, who is joining us today from Singapore. So Dr. Kleem is a fellow at the uh, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at NTU in Singapore. And Frederick's research interests include a range of different topics, including regional integration, geopolitics, multilateralism in Asia and Europe. Uh, he's an expert on the EU's approach to this region, but also, of course, being based in Singapore uh, and having a foothold there in ASEAN. He has a lot of expertise on that part of the world as well. So Frederick, we're delighted to have you. Uh, the virtual floor, anyways, is uh, yours at this point. Hi, thank you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction. Really appreciate it. Indeed, I work a bit on the intersection between uh, interregionalism, I guess, between ASEAN and uh, the European Union, and where they intersect and where not. Um, thank you very much for this uh, a great in, uh, for this kind invitation for to this great and, and indeed timely event. This uh, interest in the Indo-Pacific is great, as we all know. Also, uh, big thanks to the KS office in, in Canada for their generous support. And in fact, KS also makes a lot of stuff happening here in our region in Asia, and we're, we are very uh, grateful for that here. Um, there's so much to say and discuss in, 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 in only three, four minutes time. So perhaps as the first speaker, I, I, I try to uh, set the scene a bit of, from a perspective of a European living, living in Asia and observing it through European eyes being based here for many years. Um, the Indo-Pacific debate, of course, is a big issue here in this region and it has been for some years now. It's, it's more than a simple name change or linguistic nuance, right? Well, the Asia-Pacific was a lot about economic interdependence and regional integration. And so, for some, to some extent, the Indo-Pacific debate now is, in fact, the unraveling of that. Um, it, at the very least, it's a, it, it's a big strategic rethink about the region in light of great power competition and, and, and and other other things um, in Asia now. However, we're a bit beyond this debate of what actually is the Indo-Pacific, right? And what, what what does it mean? We are now at a 
second stage, perhaps, which is discussing implementation and concrete policies and, and behavior in, in, in concrete um, um, situations, if you like. So in, in Europe, however, we are several stages behind, naturally, uh, the discussion there is only just really beginning just now. It's uh, at the beginning of a long process, I guess, right? Um, a process of the realization of how important this region really is for them. Um, and nonetheless, it's quite remarkable what has been happening there over the past two years or so, right? Had you told me two years ago what, what Europe and Germany and France would be doing right now, I, I would have told you you must be crazy, right? And yet it, it's, it's happening. So um, uh, things are moving fast, but there are several steps behind. Um, so following members such as France and Germany, but also the UK and Netherlands to some extent, the EU now has published their own strategy, or at least there are, um, have published a first draft and it will be finalized later this year. Um, um, and to some extent, they are incorporating the motivations of all the member states that have so far uh, been putting out their own strategies and they're all very different. For Germany, for example, it's mostly alliance loyalty, whereas for France, they have clear national assets here in the region, right? So the EU is combining this to, to some extent, and, um, and, and and the first draft looks 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 great. The easiest criticism, I guess, that's a good place to, to dive into what is actually the content of it, is the, the, the easiest criticism you could level really against this paper, in fact, against any EU foreign and defense policy, is that it's quite ambiguous and it's, it's of course, lacking the hard power, right? The deployable military assets uh, to back it up. So um, this is something that you hear quite frequently in inside Europe, of course, but also here in this region. And I, I personally think it's a bit of unfair and it's a bit of a misrepresentation of what the EU can really do and is already doing. Right? Um, um, I, and yet we need to do some expectation management nonetheless, right? So, of course, the European Union, I'm not telling you anything new if I tell you that the European Union is not suddenly becoming a projector of hard power, right? But the EU is concentrating on what its strengths are. And I was very much hoping that they would, and now reading the paper, I can, I can safely say they are. They're enhancing multilateralism here in this region, most importantly, of course, with ASEAN, but also others, uh, uh, IORA comes to mind, BIMSTEC and so forth. Um, uh, but also in widening its trade networks, right? FDA, investment in Greece and so forth. Diversification of supply chain is quite a thing now. Uh, and most importantly, possibly connectivity investment. This is, uh, uh, there is a big need here in this gap and in, in, in this region and the European Union really has plenty of resources and experience in that department. And, and they're really focusing on that in that um, in, in their paper too, which is great. The other criticism is really linked to that and it's ambiguity. So one might criticize the EU for, for example, not calling out China directly, like the US do and some others too. But that would be somewhat unfair too, I think, and certainly a bit unrealistic. So all the policy areas I mentioned basically seek to offer alternatives, right? Alternatives here in the region, alternatives for others to perhaps move away from China mostly, but also to have alternatives in, in a more general sense, right? To get away from this binary interpretation of this region. And if you look at all the Indo-Pacific papers that have been published so far, you would see that there are basically two formats, right? There's inclusive and exclusive uh, formats. And the beauty of the European approach, really, and ASEAN uh, 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 too, in, in, in that matter, um, are not security focused and they are inclusive, right? So there is security elements in it and there is some criticism of China, but by and large, they're not hard security focused and they are inclusive. And this, this approach or this strategy is really designed to move away from this binary zero-sum competition and to prevent polarization. It is not to take sides, it is to prevent polarization, right? So, of course, you can imagine from what sides the criticism would come, but this is really what the European Union wants to bring to the table, and it's very much in line with ASEAN's outlook there. Um, the most fundamental conceptual question, of course, remains, right? How do we address this evidently changing balance of power here in the region of international relations, security and trade and so forth. And the Americans have found their answer. Um, so have the Quad members for the most part at least. And Europe is only slowly readjusting. It's, as I said, it's a very slow process. Um, and they have to acknowledge that their security role is very limited and their strength is elsewhere and that's what they're doing. Uh, of course, the final problem, and, and, and I think my time is up, so I, I, I will wrap it up here. The final problem is of course implementation and that's always a problem in the EU. But the, the, despite the great obstacles there are, the EU Indo-Pacific approach is a promising first step 
formal engagement, it is a realization that this region matters. It is a show of force, it is a show of intent here to this region. And um, of course, the Europeans will continue to individually engage all the members as they have done for a long time. But they will also do it as one EU wherever possible. But this will mostly be in, in non-military matters, of course. And maybe later in the discussion, we can talk in what areas that will be or, um, 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 and where bilateral makes more sense and where EU minilaterals perhaps make sense. So with that, I leave it for now. I think my time is up. I thank you and uh, I'm looking forward to the other speakers and the discussion. Thanks. Many thanks, Frederick. That was fantastic. Uh, um, and you, you packed a lot in there in a very concise uh, um, presentation. Um, you know, many takeaways that I have uh, that we'll probably get to in the moderate discussion, but I think I like to, especially your, your, a uh, couple of your perspectives, which very much relate to some of the discussions going on here uh, in Canada. The one uh, idea that, you know, if we cannot bring hard power to the region, especially defense and security, um, uh, through the defense and security lens, what sort of role can uh, can Canada have in this region? I think this a similar discussion and debate is uh, is being had here in Ottawa. The other interesting point um, that I take away from your discussion was on ambiguity uh, and the idea of, of uh, you know, how we frame the Indo-Pacific, how that relates to our China relationship. I think that's also a discussion that we're actively having here. And the third and very important thing, and I say this as a former uh, bureaucrat as well as the implementation stage. I think it's very, very important. I think often there's a lot of great ideas that uh, that have very little chance of being implemented or uh, there is no plan to implement them. So I think that's also uh, a very important and key point that we can uh, get to later. So thank you very much, Frederick. Very interesting uh, kickoff uh, to today's discussion. Uh, so I'd like to uh, pivot now. We're going to uh, travel uh, virtually anyways across the uh, Pacific and back to uh, to the United States um, and uh, hear from our next panelist, uh, who is uh, Lisa Curtis, uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, Lisa is a senior fellow and, and director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security in Washington. Uh, she has great experience uh, in the United States government on, on a range of these issues. She's a um, foreign policy national security expert with over 20 years of service in the United States government. Now she's on the outside, uh, so a little bit of different air, uh, I guess, Lisa. Uh, but she's worked, She's had great posts, including most recently at the National Security Council in the White House, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, State Department, and Capitol Hill. Uh, so Lisa, it's a real pleasure to have you. Um, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and thanks to the McDonald Lawyer Institute for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be part of this very distinguished panel, and I'll provide uh, the U.S. perspective on the issue. Uh, of course, meeting the rising challenge from China, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, is the top foreign policy national security priority of the Biden administration. But I think what is striking is the continuity in policies uh, toward China and the Indo-Pacific from the previous administration. Um, what we see is five months into the Biden administration, uh, they have sanctioned uh, Chinese officials over human rights concerns in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Uh, they've agreed to retain the uh, designation of uh, genocide for what's happening to the treatment of Uyghurs. Uh, they've lifted restrictions on diplomatic engagements with Taiwanese officials. They've reviewed U.S. supply chains to reduce U.S. dependency on China. Uh, so I think what we have seen is a continuity. And if there were any questions that the Biden administration would somehow soften uh, the previous administration's policies or decrease its focus on this vital region, I think we can clearly answer that question that no, they have not decreased focus um, and it will continue to, to frame the foreign policy of this administration moving forward. Um, one of the key Indo-Pacific initiatives that the Biden administration has continued, of course, is uh, bolstering the Quad. This is US, India, Japan, Australia. Um, during the previous administration, uh, we had resurrected the Quad in 2017, holding uh, meetings every six months at the assistant secretary level. And then, of course, two foreign minister level meetings in 2019 and 2020. But the Biden team has sort of taken this to the next level by holding the first ever leaders level meeting, issuing the first ever 
joint statement of the Quad in March of this year. And we're hearing that they want to do an in-person leaders level meeting by September. So this would be quite remarkable to have two leaders level engagements of the Quad within a six month period. Now, one key difference, of course, for, uh, of the Biden administration from the uh, Trump administration is its focus on working with transatlantic partners and allies. Um, and I think the recent visit of President Biden to Europe to attend the G7, meet with the UK, EU and NATO partners really marks a significant departure from what we have seen over the last four years. And I think we've already seen that engagement pay off. Uh, if you look at the G7 communique that came out, it does call on China for human rights abuses. Uh, it mentions the need for peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits. It mentions uh, a G7 infrastructure initiative in the Indo-Pacific, and it addresses the need to counter anti-market Chinese trade practices. Um, now we know China will continue to try to circumvent global norms uh, to try to gain strategic advantage and seek to dominate critical technologies. Uh, China also has been using economic coercion. We saw this in the case of Australia, when last year Australia called for an investigation into the origins of the coronavirus. Uh, China promptly cut its beef imports and put tariffs on its barley imports from Australia. Um, and I think another lesson that we learned from the pandemic was how uh, critical it is to have uh, transparent societies and government actions uh, for maintaining the health of our populations and the prosperity of our economies. Um, additionally, the COVID-19 pandemic has showed us that we don't want to be dependent on Chinese supply chains. We found that we were overly dependent on China for things like pharmaceutical ingredients and PPE. Um, so this is why the White House has prioritized redirecting critical supply chains uh, to reduce U.S. dependency on China. Two weeks ago, the White House released its findings from its 100-day uh, review of critical supply chains, highlighting that it is strengthening the semiconductor supply chains, um, enhancing U.S. rare earth mining and processing capabilities, and addressing cyber vulnerabilities in our supply chains. Um, so let me just conclude by noting that it's critical that countries like Canada broaden their foreign policy focus to the Indo-Pacific region in order to help deter Chinese aggressive behavior and provide these countries alternatives um, when it comes to economic development or uh, technological infrastructure. Um, it's very important that uh, like-minded countries are pooling our resources and capabilities, setting the norms and standards uh, for free and open uh, trade and engagement. Um, and Canada, I think, has a, a very important role to play there. Um, Jonathan was talking about uh, non-military ways to engage. Um, obviously, there are so many ways, the infrastructure initiative um, being one that, that comes to mind, but I'm sure that, that many other ideas are going to come out of this discussion. Um, and I look forward to uh, engaging and, and any questions uh, that come up. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Lisa. Again, uh, really excellent uh, comments, and I have millions of questions, but I'll uh, I'll resist the temptation. But uh, just to highlight a couple of things that kind of came to mind in your remarks. I mean, the one thing, and I think it's a really important point that you have to consistently um, put forward when talking about the U.S. approach to this region is the consistency. And I'm really happy that you mentioned that. Um, I think a lot has been made of the sometimes the semantics and the wording of you know if, even going back to the Obama days from pivot to rebalance to free and open Indo-Pacific, and now we're in the Biden administration. Um, but I think as you as you rightly referenced, the nuts and bolts of sort of um, how the U.S. has been approaching this region is more of an evolution than a revolution. Um, and I often use sort of the Christmas present analogy, whereas largely the Christmas present is the same present you're going to get every year. It's the wrapping that changes a little bit from 
from year to year. Uh, but but you know the U.S. has obviously been evolving its approach to this region with the uh, with the evolution of some of the challenges. Um, but the realities of its interests have not uh, fundamentally changed. So I think that's a really important point. Um, I also like, and we'll definitely pick up on this later, and I'm sure other panelists will, will talk about it too, is the different formulations in the minilateral and multilateral space and how they're looking at this region. So no longer is it just, for example, you know, the U.S. bilateral alliance networks, uh, the Quad, uh, the resurgent Quad, but it's also the G7. It's also NATO. I think a, a lot of multilateral organizations are starting to look at this region, not just specifically China, but the Indo-Pacific more broadly. Um, and your point on supply chains is also uh, very, very important and, and something that we've uh, um, been looking at quite closely here in Canada. So thank you very much, Lisa. Very informative uh, uh, comments. Um, so I'm going to uh, transition now. Uh, we're going to move across the Atlantic now, uh, and uh, and we're going to go for our third speaker, who is uh, uh, Dr. Mohan. Um, uh, Dr. Garima Mohan is a fellow in the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, where she works and is the lead on uh, India and also heads the India Trilateral Forum. Uh, she's a prolific author, has a you know, range of really interesting commentaries, which I've enjoyed over the years, and, and we're, uh, we're delighted to have you, uh, Grima. Uh, please, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you for the invite to this amazing panel, and what an honor to go after Lisa, who's actually been in the thick of it when it comes to formulating uh, Indo-Pacific policies in the region. Today, I've been asked to talk about India's approach to the Indo-Pacific and what opportunities would India see for engaging with Canada. Um, I'll start talking about India's vision, what are the drivers of its engagement in the Indo-Pacific, what are the instruments by which India is engaging in the region, and then finish with some ideas for how would India perceive um, Canada's involvement and uh, some takeaways as Canada formulates its approach to the Indo-Pacific. So India, of course, is a crucial pillar when it comes to a multipolar Indo-Pacific region, but it's also an important element of the Indo-Pacific strategies of countries around the world. India's own uh, vision to the Indo-Pacific, you cannot find it in a written document or strategy anywhere, just because it's not part of Indian strategic culture, but um, you can understand its vision by looking at the 2018 speech the Indian Prime Minister made at the Shangri-La Dialogue, um, followed by other statements from defense and diplomatic staff, which essentially argue that India sees the Indian and Pacific Oceans as a single strategic space, sees the Indo-Pacific as a theater of opportunity, but also a theater of emerging competition, um, and then focuses on maritime domain again, um, which is important for both competition and cooperation in the region. What are the drivers of India's engagement? I think the most important reason sort of driving India's engagement in the Indo-Pacific, and that is also shaping the evolution of India's Indo-Pacific policy is of course the rise of China, increasing influence of China and increasingly assertive behavior of China, which India of course has had um, um, a quick taste of uh, and also has had to deal with, particularly given the crisis on the India-China border. But there are also, of course, other issues of increasing Chinese presence in India's neighborhood in the Indian Ocean region, um, political and economic influence through the Belt and Road, which is, of course, a concern. Another driver of India's um, interest in the Indo-Pacific is, of course, an understanding that current institutions in the region are not fit to deal with the challenges the Indo-Pacific faces today. And finally, I think it's also a recognition of India's own capabilities. Uh, the India's capabilities have increased and it can indeed play a larger role in the Indo-Pacific. How is India translating its Indo-Pacific vision into policy? And here we come at a number of interesting developments. First of all, India has really reinvigorated its bilateral partnerships with each of the Quad partners. The India-US relationship has seen um, huge, remarkable growth, but also India's security as well as di um, diplomatic partnerships have really deepened with Japan, with Australia, with France, with Indonesia. There's been a sort of revitalization of its partnerships. 
Second is India's Act East policy, which translates into more engagement with Southeast Asia and ASEAN countries, particularly, again, Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, where both in terms of diplomacy, but also security cooperation, India has really increased its uh, engagement with the region. Um, the most interesting trend, in my view, in the Indo-Pacific is, of course, the emergence of issue-based coalitions. And this is where India, too, is plugging in in different points. The most uh, prominent example of this is, of course, the Quad. Uh, but we've also seen, for example, the India, Australia, Japan, um, trilateral on supply chains, the France, India, Australia trilateral conversation that has focused a lot on maritime security in the Indian Ocean. Uh, these issue-based coalitions are quite interesting, particularly for a country like India. Its former Foreign Secretary Gokhale remarked, India is becoming an aligned state, but based on issues. So not, not allied, but aligned with different countries based on different issues. Um, there are also a few things which are new for Indian foreign policy. For example, strategic use of ODA, uh, overseas development assistance, particularly to the Indian Ocean Island states, as well as countries in the South Pacific, um, shedding its traditional reluctance to work with extra regional powers. For example, working with Japan in Sri Lanka and India and the United States cooperating and working together in the Maldives. Uh, these are new developments that Indian foreign policy is pursuing. Uh, and finally, India, of course, wants to be a net security provider in the Indian Ocean. It plays a crucial role in the Indian Ocean region, which is, again, a pillar of India's engagement in the Indo-Pacific. Overall, for many countries, as they translate their Indo-Pacific policies into action, but also for India, the idea of working with old partners, revitalizing new partnerships, but most importantly, working in new coalitions, whether these are issue-based coalitions, new networks, creating a hub of aligned countries. I think this is, this is something really remarkable and new for Indian foreign policy. In this, this, it's in this way that India has been engaging now with Europe as more European countries get interested in working with the Indo-Pacific. Uh, trying to explore where they can plug in into the networks in the region. And this brings me to the question of Canada. Um, I'm very interested to see uh, and hear your views on how Canada is approaching the region. But I think um, from, from, the, from a regional perspective, it's important to note that Canada is already coming into a quite crowded region. Uh, the, re the debate on Indo-Pacific has been going on for much longer. So what you're willing to bring to the table is how you'll be welcomed. It is important for Canada, therefore, to talk about its capabilities, what it brings to the region. Second, I think it's important to not work at cross purposes with your partners in the region. Therefore, coordination is quite important. Uh, most importantly, where can Canada plug into the flexible coalitions on technology, on supply chains, on the strategic use of development aid, development assistance? I think those are important questions to figure out. Uh, and finally, not everyone has to do everything in the Indo-Pacific. I tell this to the Europeans who are interested in the region. This would be my same input for Canada as well figure out which are the areas you want to plug into where you can bring something to the table, who are your most important regional partners, how you can uh, support those regional partners, and where can you plug into these new coalitions, for example, working with the Quad countries, uh, but also in other flexible formats. And finally, I think all countries are striking a balancing act on China. So in a way, Canada's policy on China will definitely intersect and have an, um, have an impact on, on its Indo-Pacific engagement as well. And I think partners in the region would be quite curious to see how Canada positions itself um, and what it brings to the region in terms of the debate on China as well. I'll stop here. Thank you. Many thanks, Grima. That uh, was excellent. And especially, uh, really appreciate you uh, spending a, a bit of time and dedicating some time to um, what Canada could potentially, uh, what role Canada could 
potentially play in this region. Uh, some really interesting um, prescriptive comments that you had there. Uh, you know, I, I would agree with you on the idea, and I think it's instructive to learn from Mindy's example about some of the challenges and, and, uh, and inefficiencies in uh, multilateral architecture to deal with the challenges in this region. Uh, and I also like how you framed it about the issue-based uh, alignments or coalitions that India has been engaged in. I think sometimes from a, a broad perspective of those who haven't really been um, uh, razor focused on this region, they, they look at the quad and they just assume that's the only sort of alignment or engagement. But as you said, um, India has been working on so many webs of trilaterals, bilaterals, um, some of them more um, broad based, but some of them more really specific on certain issues. And I think that provides some really interesting opportunities and, and openings for Canada. Um, in addition to your point of number one, don't duplicate and uh, uh, duplicate efforts with uh, allies and partners, but also make it meaningful and unique. I think those are two really interesting suggestions. Uh, don't just show up and say, I, "I'm ready to to, to play in the Indo-Pacific." Um, you need to actually have some tangible and concrete areas um, that benefit uh, um, you uh, and also benefit the region. So, uh, really excellent comments, Grima. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to move uh, to our next speaker, and uh, we're going to be moving uh, back to Asia uh, for our next speaker. Uh, she's based in Tokyo. Um, so uh, Professor uh, Akiko Fukushima, uh, who is currently Senior Fellow at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research, uh, and formerly a professor at uh, Aoyama Gakuin University in Tokyo. Um, you know, she's a prolific author on, on the Indo-Pacific and other uh, political security issues in Japan and has had a long uh, history studying this. Uh, I've had the pleasure to uh, share a, a panel with her recently on uh, Canada and Japan and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to, uh, to have you again to, uh, to hear your views. Uh, Fukushima-sensei, uh, the, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you very much for uh, your kind invitation to join this conversation on a Pacific uh, realignment. In my initial remark, I would like to cover three points from uh, my perspective sitting in Tokyo, namely how and why Japan has taken an initiative on the free and open Indo-Pacific, how Japan implements its uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, and conclude with a potential areas of cooperation with Canada. First, how has uh, Japan taken an initiative on Indo-Pacific? Although there are debates over who took the original initiative on the concept of Indo-Pacific, I would argue that Japan was at the least one of the first to launch the concept uh, the origin of Japanese uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, dates back to 2007 when former Prime Minister Abe spoke at Indian Parliament on the confluence of the two seas, uh, namely the Indian and Pacific Ocean. And in 2016, Japan officially launched a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy in uh, Kenya. The Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific has evolved since its launch. Initially, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific was termed as strategy. However, facing, uh, faced with a Chinese criticism that FOIP is a containment strategy against China, Japan has changed the term from strategy to initiative in the summer of 2018, which mitigated Chinese criticisms. Secondly, although FOIP was observed initially as an exclusive concept from outside, Japan has made it clear that free and open Indo-Pacific initiative is an inclusive concept, as was mentioned in the Diplomatic Blue Book 2020. Thirdly, while in some corners, Japan's FOIP or free and open Indo-Pacific was observed as focusing on maritime se security alone, Japan, as a matter of fact, has included the rules-based order, economic prosperity through free trade and connectivity, and capacity building and other measures to uh, promote security prosperity uh, of the Indo-Pacific. I would also like to add that Free and Open Indo-Pacific Initiative is the first regional initiative that Japan has explicitly uh, taken and has successfully put like-minded uh, countries on board. Uh, 
Now, why has Japan enlarged the regional concept from the Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific? There are several reasons behind it. First and foremost, the reason is Japan's wish to engage in the economic potential of the Indo-Pacific region, which I believe is common among countries who have launched the Indo-Pacific policies. Building on our cooperation in the Asia-Pacific, mostly in, on economic side, but some security, Japan saw a need to include thriving economies such as India and Africa in our concept and the need to secure sea lanes of communication from Africa all the way to the Pacific. Secondly, Japan shares concern on frame regional and in global order in the Indo-Pacific. Japan saw a need to cooperate with like-minded countries to refit international and regional order. And uh, thirdly, Japan is concerned with growingly assertive or even aggressive and sometimes coercive actions taken by a rising power. So these elements have uh, compelled Japan to broaden the regional scope from Asia Pacific to the Indo Pacific. I hasten to add, however, that Japan did not abandon the Asia Pacific nor e East Asia scope of cooperation, but rather added another layer called Indo Pacific to form a multi layered competition. As an illustration, Prime Minister Suga has emphasized the role of ASEAN in the Indo-Pacific and welcomed EOIP, ASEAN outlook on uh, Indo-Pacific. How does Japan implement its free and open Indo-Pacific initiative? Incumbent Prime Minister Suga inherited FOIP, as he himself has made it clear in his first press conference as a Prime Minister September last year, as well as through his trips to uh, Southeast Asia last fall and through his uh, recent series of uh, trips to the US and also meeting with the Quad members and uh, in the G7. In the G7 uh, summit, uh, Prime Minister Suga exerted his efforts to include in the communique the importance of maintaining free and open Indo-Pacific, which is uh, inclusive and based on the rule of law. Japan has taken initiative on connectivity, as uh, most of you know, and quality infrastructure structure is something Japan is pushing forward, including digital connectivity. On the rule of law, uh, Japan promotes maritime order in the region and has offered capacity building uh, in uh, maritime security as well as maritime domain awareness. Japan plans to cooperate in the field of uh, vaccine, climate change, new technology and innovation, including digital in uh, Indo-Pacific. So uh, Japan uh, wants to implement issue-based or functional cooperation in the Indo-Pacific further. In concluding, I would like to touch on uh, potential co cooperation with Canada. The Indo-Pacific is facing intensifying great power politics, strained order, uh, competition over vaccination to territorial waters, domestic confusion, widening inequality, and nuclear proliferation. The region is filled with future potential as well as uncertainties and anxieties, which I believe uh, would be drivers for cooperation with Canada and in the broader Asia of uh, Indo-Pacific. I have my personal memories of working together with Canadian colleagues on the Asia Pacific at Track 2 and Track 1.5 in the 1990s. I trust Japan and Canada can cooperate in the Indo-Pacific as well. As a matter of fact, Foreign Minister Motegi and Foreign Minister Como of Canada on May 3rd, 2021, during their visit to UK for the summit for a minister's meeting announced the shared Japan-Canada priorities contributing to the, a free and open Indo-Pacific. And these priority areas have been endorsed by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Suga uh, 
when they met uh, at the time of the G7 summit in UK, included in the document are priority areas such as rule of law, peacekeeping operations, peace building and humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, health security, re responding to COVID-19, energy security, free trade promotion, and trade agreement implementation, and environment and climate change. These are uh, potential functional cooperation that we can pursue in uh, greater Indo-Pacific, I believe. And um, I personally am interested in seeing cooperation in the field of peacekeeping operations, peace building, and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in, uh, with Canada. If uh, you would like to know more, I will expand it later. But I would like to uh, conclude with one note, I'm advised that there are some hesitations in Canada uh, to launch a narrative on Indo-Pacific with a fear to be seen as antagonistic to China. This concern is not unique to Canada, but is shared by many at varying degrees, isn't it? Still, uh, Still, for our respective and regional peace, stability, and prosperity, I hope Japan and Canada can join forces in the Indo-Pacific as we have done in the Asia-Pacific. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Fukushima Sensei. Really interesting comments, and I, I liked your conclusion because I think that um, feeds into a, a discussion and a narrative that we often hear uh, here in Canada. And I think, as I've often tried to frame it, is that, of, of course, China is part of our Indo-Pacific and the way that we view this region, um, but we shouldn't view the formulation of a strategy or an approach uh, to this region as a sort of a causal relationship or a, a punitive measure um, uh, as it uh, relates to our relationship with China, but more broadly, the shared interests and values that we have with uh, everyone else in this region, um, including those who are not traditionally seen in this region. I think, uh, as um, you know, Frederick mentioned, the EU approach, uh, we have a lot of friends who share values and interests with us in this region, and I think that is the backbone of a strategic approach. Um, very interesting comments. Uh, I also uh, you noted your point on the Japan sort of multi-layered and nuanced approach, the evolution of the free and open Indo-Pacific um, from strategy to a vision. So some very interesting takeaways there for Canada. I uh, very much appreciate your insights and uh, we'll come back to you uh, during the moderated discussion. Uh, so moving on, uh, we're going to uh, move to Paris and, uh, and my good uh, friend and, uh, and colleague at uh, the Japan Institute of International Affairs, uh, uh, Dr. Valerie Nikkei. Uh, Valerie uh, is the head of the Asia program at, uh, at uh, FRS in Paris, and she's also a senior research fellow at JAYA. She's published uh, very widely a significant amount of publications uh, on China, on the Indo-Pacific, on Japan, um, and uh, we're delighted to have you, Valerie. So, uh, uh, Valerie, please, the virtual floor is yours. Sorry, Valerie, you're, you're on mute. Always the same mistake, sorry. <laughs> and um, thank you to, for, for the invitation first. And it's a very good opportunity for me. And there were so many uh, brilliant um, presentations before. But I, maybe I would like to stick to just a few points from the European Union perspective and um, let's be a little bit uh, shall i say provocative actually jumping from what has been already said before um of course the good thing is that at last including for the eu at the eu level that for many years was extremely reticent to be too involved in security but there's hard security affairs and sticking to values and so on uh, uh, in its relations with Asia and the Asia Pacific and Indo Pacific, uh, there is a, a big change. And it's not only this year, it's not only post COVID, it's not only even 2019 when, uh, for the first time, China was described as a systemic rival, which was a new kind of realism on the part of the uh, European Union. But even before, uh, in previous paper on China, for instance, the EU started to say that China, of of course, it was a source of opportunities, but also a, a, a very important source of potential instability and thus insecurity for the for Europe, not only I mean Europe as a whole. And of course, China is becoming, even though it's extremely difficult to say it openly 
for some, it is becoming uh, the major factor that uh, bring uh, a new impetus to the uh, Indo-Pacific strategic and thinking regarding the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but so everyone now, as J Joseph Borrell just mentioned when he was in Jakarta, so, so it's, it's becoming the, the thing to do. I mean, everyone now has a kind of uh, Indo-Pacific strategy or Indo-Pacific vision of thinking. Uh, but it also, what is interesting is that we have to be careful that it doesn't lead to, it also reflects, I, sorry, my English is hesitant, but it also reflects sometimes a kind of competitive interest be, between different uh, actors uh, inside the EU, but also between the EU and the US, for instance, uh, on inside the EU between uh, member states regarding what to do uh, and also, what is um, the scope of what the European Union can do or Europeans can do in the Asia Pacific? Some do still believe that, yes, of course, values is extremely important, shared values. Uh, this is a common language that we can have, common denominator that we can have with many countries in the region, except China, maybe. Uh, but is it enough? And we see now that there is a, a development towards a more her hard security approach towards uh, the Indo-Pacific, even though uh, at the EU level, at least, uh, the, um, the means, the capacity to act are still extremely limited. And you're right, Jonathan, and also um, uh, Dr. Fukushima, it's, uh, it's something that is shared by many. Actually, the big problem is what do we do between China that is still perceived as a leading power in terms of economic growth opportunities, especially in the post-COVID uh, situation. And this is true for Japan. This is true for, for Europe. This is true for Germany, for Canada, of course. And at the same time, realizing and saying loudly, let us look at what is going on in Hong Kong these days, for instance, that China is definitely uh, extremely uh, uh, potentially disturbing actor. So this is my last question, because I want to be brief and maybe launch from this to uh, in the discussion is, is it okay, is it possible to say, to stick to the uh, spirit of inclusiveness regarding China. Uh, we say that we need China in order to tackle big global issues, like for instance, climate change. Uh, but is China playing such a positive role? Uh, did China play a positive or cooperative role regarding COVID-19, regarding some other issues that we have in common? And uh, is it possible actually to be inclusive with China? If not, how can we, between us democracies, discuss the best way to maybe, I mean, many reject the idea that we have to choose, but is it possible to go on not choosing? This is my concluding word because I wanted to be brief and stick to my five minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Valerie. I always enjoy uh, your your comments and uh, a lot of interesting takeaways. I mean, a very uh, um, very good and, and blunt and frank question, which I think is uh, you know uh, helps me and also I think uh, helps the other panelists think about uh, how to approach the moderated discussion. I also liked your your uh, take on. Uh, the view that everybody is coming up with an Indo-Pacific strategy or vision, and uh, it's the new sort of thing. It's almost like uh, the new fashion trend. But rather than making it a fashion trend, and rather than just sort of coming out with some language, uh, stock language on the Indo-Pacific, I think having that targeted, having that meaningful, and really looking not just in the one-year lens, but looking in five, ten years, what will this actually mean, um, I think is really important. Um, and I think you were sort of hinting at that uh, that idea. So very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Valerie, and, and we're going to come back to you in the, uh, in the moderated discussion. Um, so to um, move uh, now to our last speaker uh, before we sort of kick uh, kick start the discussion, I'm going to move back to Ottawa here in Canada uh, and uh, welcome Margaret uh, McQuaig Johnson. Uh, Margaret uh, is a uh, also a prolific author on Indo-Pacific, uh, China, and other elements. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy at the University of Ottawa, uh, a board member at the Canadian International Council, uh, and an advisory board member of the uh, Canada, China, Canada China Forum. Uh, she's held a range of other distinguished posts, and obviously has had a very long and distinguished career uh, as a civil servant in the uh, Canadian Public Service. Uh, Margaret, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we're delighted to have you. 
Thanks very much, Jonathan. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here today with these eminent uh, panelists from countries of tremendous importance to Canada. I've been looking forward to this discussion because in my view, developing an Indo-Pacific strategy is one of the most important initiatives Canada's current government has embarked on, not just because the region is the epicenter of economic growth, but because of the potential to build collaborations. Canada is a North Pacific nation and therefore has naturally looked directly across the Pacific to China in the past, but we've seen that that relationship carries with it significant risks, which are not diminishing. As our ministers have been saying, the China of 2021 is not the China of 2016. And our companies now are looking to broaden and deepen their relations with other countries in the region. Consequently, the Government of Canada has been working diligently in consultation with other nations in the Indo-Pacific, both like-minded and those where we have common interests, towards Canada's emerging approach to an Indo-Pacific strategy. In addition, in virtual bilateral meetings, Canadian foreign and trade ministers have had many productive meetings with their counterparts in other countries in the region. There are many fields in which there can be more engagement by Canada, including diversification of our supply chains, high-tech co collaboration, trade, manufacturing, investment, infrastructure, digital economy, and especially energy and rare earths. While some companies in the past may have thought it was possible to pass through one door to engage with China, what they often found is that China is not one big market, but 40 or 50 regional markets, depending on the sector. In fact, in many ways, it's easier to sell to and buy from numerous, numerous countries in the Indo-Pacific region because they have systems of rule of law in their favor. Other important areas for engagement are higher education, science and technology, security, population health, environment, and climate change. Canada is already contributing to international bodies in the region, uh, such as CPTPP, where I hope we will see the membership of the UK and Taiwan, since they can offer significant economic contributions to this important trade alliance. Furthermore, the G10 took its first steps under the UK's initiative at the G7 meeting, bringing in Australia, South Korea, and India. In addition, Canada has a naval presence in the Pacific, and I see the potential in the longer term for us to contribute to the Quad, and certainly in the shorter term, to the Quad technology network. And of course, we have 17 fellow Commonwealth nations in the region. There are two key factors that I think will be a requirement for the success of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. The first is fully resourcing it so that it will have significant impact with both funding and people to implement a rich and dynamic strategy. In this respect, it can also draw in the resources of Canada's private sector, which has deep roots in many countries in the region and whose engagement and perspectives will be important in mounting a successful strategy. The other factor is that it be designed to be sustained and effectively coordinated. We've heard the messages from some in the region that in past Canada's engaged for a while, but later had been distracted by other priorities. This new strategy will need to be a whole of government priority for the long term with the mandates of key government departments having an Indo-Pacific dimension integrated right into their core activities. There would also need to be effective coordination in order to mount and implement an effective strategy. I have no doubt that with these components, the strategy will be successful. Thanks, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Many thanks, uh, Margaret. That's a really great kickoff into our discussion. Um, a lot of really, um, you know, concrete and tangible sort of recommendations uh, for the future of how Canada should look at this region. I think you're very right on the idea of, of resources, obviously being an essential and important one. But I think also changing the culture and, and the way that this region is viewed, and sometimes that's even you know shuffling around a few things in the bureaucracy and making sure that this is uh, not just seen as sort of a project or a 
you know, a one or two year effort, but a long term strategic priority uh, and, and defining it that in, in that way. Um, so thank you very much. Again, I always learn a lot from your comments. Um, I'd like to shift now to the moderated discussion. And um, since we have such a great cast here, uh, I'd like everyone to be as brief as possible when I call, call on you uh, for this. I know there's so many thoughts and, and this could be a you know, a two day conference, but uh, please be, uh, you know, a, a minute or so uh, on your interventions if you can hold yourself to that. Um, so, uh, and the audience also has some interesting questions too, which I'd like to get to uh, if we get the time. Um, the first sort of question that I have, and uh, we have, um, you know, three members uh, here anyways of, of the quad, uh, although I know you don't represent necessarily your, uh, your national bureaucracies, um, but there's been a lot of discussion obviously focused on the quad, and, and this question doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, talking about the future of the quad, what it can do, what it can't do, um, but I want to talk more broadly, and I think Garima uh, brought up this really good point about issue-based coalitions and different sort of alignments uh, and how the multilateral um, frameworks and structures aren't necessarily sufficient to deal with some of these challenges. Um, for, as a country, you know, from the Canadian vantage point, how should we be looking at at these sort of alignments and coalitions? Is the Quad, uh, is there a potential for Canada to be involved in something such as the Quad? Um, and if it's not the Quad, are there other sort of alignments that make, that would you feel that would make sense uh, that Canada could, could contribute to? Um, and uh, the last one to sort of dovetail an audience question uh, that I think is very related to this. So rather than um, saving that for later, one of the audience member asked about coordination um, up between the Quad and potentially with ASEAN. Obviously, we know there's some inherent uh, challenges and sensitivities uh, be between the two. Um, but I think you know, Frederick obviously would be really well placed to talk about that with his vantage point there in Singapore. Uh, so this broader question about frameworks to deal with these challenges, whether it's quad, whether it's mini laterals, uh, and what the potential you feel um, for Canada's role uh, could be there. So if I can uh, start um, off with Frederick on this uh, this point, uh, and then I'll uh, I'll move along. So Frederick, uh, please. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so what was the question? How how the how can the quad engage with ASEAN, right? Uh, yeah. So is is there a space for coordination between uh, ASEAN yeah. and its related forums uh, and these sort of sensitivities, or how do you see the future of this playing out? Yeah. So I think you already you, you already indicated that this is difficult, and I would definitely echo that. That's that that's from my perspective here, from this region, from how I know ASEAN, and from our. For my for my conversations I'm having here in this region, it's very very unlikely. So you do see the Quad Plus mechanism, right? That has come up uh, uh, towards the end of last year, where whereby individual ASEAN members would 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 uh, uh, join conversations with the Quad on, on certain issues such as vaccine and so forth, and and really go away from this hard power um, uh, bias the Quad clearly has. But translating this onto the ASEAN level, I, I would find as a very, very unlikely, simply because so many ASEAN members do not want to get involved with the Quad for obvious reasons, right? So the Quad, whether it wants to be or not, or whether some people here in this region see it or not, what really important, what is really important is how China perceives this, the Quad, right? And, and, and China perceives the Quad as a as a as a, an instrument in a toolbox of containment of its rights, right? Somehow. So whether that's fair or not is a different question, but that's how they perceive it. And as soon as you get involved with it, then um, you will be automatically in this bucket, right? So this is why it will be so difficult for countries such as Japan. And we've just heard in this great presentation that Japan is trying to do uh, also be an inclusive sort of free and open Indo Pacific players. But as soon as you're a member of the Quad, that's kind of uh, squaring the circle to some extent. And the ASEAN, the ASEAN uh, states would certainly try to sh shy away from this, right? So. Um, once again, individual ASEAN member states such, such as Vietnam might think differently, um, but um, I would say engaging with ASEAN as an organization and, and, and with its platforms, I would consider very, very unlikely. Okay, thanks very much, Frederick. Interesting comments. Uh, if I can move to Valerie quickly, and, and Valerie, I, I want to get your perspective too. Uh, knowing France has been doing some interesting things in this region, um, you know, recently having trilateral exercises alongside the US. And I think Frederick brings up an interesting point, which I'd like to you know, pose to you and potentially the others could look at this too, is obviously China is concerned about the Quad, but there's so many other overlapping trilaterals and, and engagements that are also happening, uh, which in many senses are doing very similar things. 
Um, so is there something just about the quad itself, uh, you know, be, maybe because it involves India or because of the membership of, of all four? Um, but, you know, uh, it, basically, if we if we operate outside the quad, is that not going to provoke the tensions uh, to China as the, as uh, engaging in the quad would? Um, uh, interested in your thoughts uh, from a French perspective on this. Well, I think this uh, also coming back to what I said before, uh, this is exactly the point. I mean, some countries are reticent regarding the quad because they are afraid to be uh, to have to choose. Or it is presented as if you are with a quad, you choose against China. But this is true. And uh, my point is we should recognize that. I mean, the quad is a reaction to what China has been doing for years. I mean, many countries were very cooperative with China for decades. And why did all this new format evolve? Because the uh, uneasiness, and including in ASEAN, depends on the countries, of course, but including at the ASEAN level, the uneasiness, uh, worry, being worried about uh, what China is doing led to the emergence of this format. Of course, countries like India had reasons for years to be much more uneasy about China than others, for instance, like Japan also. But uh, there is a, a, something that we have to recognize here. Uh, I'm not sure constantly saying, oh, yes, we have quad, but it's not against China. Oh, yes, we have uh, Indo-security friends as a very, it's, not, it's the first one actually in Europe, so a security in the Indo-Pacific. Recently, there was an interview by uh, of uh, Amiral uh, Vendier, who is the uh, head of the Asia Pacific, in Asia Pacific or Indo, I'm, I'm very bad with, with anyway, but he said that, uh, yes, he mentioned China. I mean, sometimes you have to be very clear about the situation, not saying that you have to be aggressive against China, but I think all these format do exist. The glue actually is China. The question for France or European countries, or for, but I'm mentioning France, or I could the UK, but it's not part of the EU anymore, but it's still European, is how do you articulate what countries like France uh, is doing militarily? in the Indo-Pacific, you mentioned recently the exercises with uh, Japan and the US, but also uh, we have military cooperation with India, for instance, and other countries in uh, Southeast Asia, once again, Australia, of course. Uh, so how do you articulate this, maybe in terms of capacity building and so on, with the quad format? And how do you articulate this with the relations we may have easy or not with the United States on different priorities sometimes. So I think this is a very important point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Valerie. I think that's uh, really well taken. And it takes me back to uh, uh, a dialogue I had uh, over 10 years ago uh, in the, the first term of the Obama administration. And at the time, there was a, a senior uh, State Department official who um, we were in one of these track 1.5 closed door conferences and uh, in the open uh, session we were talking about the pivot and how uh, that might be per perceived by China. And of course the official language is that, you know, uh, this is not about containing China, this is not about uh, about China. Um, and then <laughs> in the private dollar we're like, you know, it, it, you know, how do we think about the framing of this? And like, of course it's all about China. <laughs> you know, largely this is about China, but it's it's because of the, the realities and the way that some of the um, uh, the situation has played out in the coming years, as you've referenced. So I think that on one hand, we do need to recognize that situation and respond to that situation. Um, but I think depending on this, uh, where you're placed in this region, I think there's going to be that need for that in inherent ambiguity, as I think uh, Fukushima Sensei and uh, reference. And I think uh, Frederick was talking about some of these strains also with ASEAN countries. So thank you very much. Uh, if I can move on now to some of uh, the uh, the representatives here who, who are part of the quad uh, uh, dynamics, and if I can go to uh, Garima first uh, to give her thoughts on this question, it'd be really interesting to kind of hear your your uh, um, thinking on this. And also, uh, from a political leadership perspective, often the quad concept, uh, the intellectual origins are often thought of in um, in terms of Japan and also India and also the high water political leadership of former Prime Minister Abe uh, and and Modi now. Um, Post Modi, uh, what is uh, is there going to be any? I mean, it's I guess a big question, but uh, do you think that there's going to be any sort of change of thinking on the Quad, or is this something that is more cross party lines uh, ingrained uh, in uh, the bureaucracy there in India? 
thanks, Jonathan. Uh, both interesting questions. On the on the quad, I would really like to clarify that the quad is not the be all and end all in the Indo Pacific. Um, it is. It has assumed importance as a forum. Um, eventually, uh, let's not forget when it started. There was also a lot of criticism of the quad that it is, uh, you know, it was you know, it sort of went dormant once. It was revived again. Um, it's not serious enough. Every country is issuing a separate joint statement. There has been a level of evolution in the quad, and the four countries that are part have aligned their positions on China and a lot of other challenges over time. So I don't think that the Quad should be seen as the only instrument of cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Given the enormity of the challenges and the vastness of the Indo-Pacific theater, it is not necessary that everybody has to be involved in this one format. I think that's, that's an important point to keep in mind. The French example is a very interesting one because they've really strengthened their bilateral security cooperation with each of the Quad partners individually. Uh, the French also did a joint naval exercise with the other Quad countries recently. So there are other ways of building interoperability, experience, cooperation, which go beyond the Quad. Um, it is interesting to note the new Quad working groups, and I would like to hear from Lisa over here, what would be the possibility of other countries collaborating on those particular issues. But I don't think that we all need to join the Quad. Similarly, on the question of Quad and ASEAN, every single Quad country has um, deep partnerships with ASEAN. They all mention ASEAN centrality in their individual Indo-Pacific approaches. So why do we need to have you know, a Quad plus ASEAN format? I don't think it's necessary. So we'd just like to caution on that. On your question of um, the support for the Quad in India, uh, now India has come from a sort of reluctant position to becoming a strong participant in the Quad. And let me also remind uh, folks here that when Prime Minister Modi first articulated India's Indo-Pacific vision, he was the first one, I think, to also mention the word inclusive. Um, a lot of Europeans now say think that they, they are the ones who invented the idea of an inclusive Indo-Pacific vision. But I would like to mention that countries in the region started from their position, but it was the increasingly assertive behavior of China that is forcing countries more and more to take stronger positions, and that includes India. With the current crisis on the India-China border, the escalation which has not come down, these will have far-reaching consequences. And I think that is the biggest factor pushing India to take stronger positions, be it in the Quad, be it in the Indo-Pacific, more than anything else. So I don't see that changing with the political leadership unless there is serious de-escalation and confidence building on the India-China border and in the India-China relationship more broadly. Thank you, Karim. Uh, I think uh, we're uh, centering around this point, which I think has been made by a number of uh, individuals, which I think is a, is a good one that you know, the Quad may be a, a necessary but a not sufficient uh, um, a tool to deal with some of these challenges. Obviously, it's just one part of a, of a bigger puzzle uh, for a lot of these countries, whether it's uh, regional alignments or multilateral for bilateral relations, uh, different approaches uh, to deal with these challenges. Uh, it's a really good pivot to Lisa to uh, your question, I think is a, is a really nice one to her. And I'd also just add on top of that, Lisa, a couple of questions, um, particularly as they relate to Canada. So, um, you know, not to belabor the point in the quad, but, you know, obviously in the last uh, several years, you had a, an interesting position as a practitioner working on the front lines on these issues. Um, this sort of quad plus discussion, um, is it something, you know, the quad has taken so long in itself to sort of reinvent itself the second time uh, and is still sort of working out some of the, the challenges uh, that it faces uh, as, a, as a grouping of four. Is there any real serious discussion of countries like Canada um, having any role, even if it's at an ad hoc level or issue based level uh, and not a sort of formalized uh, fifth partner. And also, I guess, in, in, outside of the quad context, but just more maybe minilaterally, whether it's trilaterally with Japan or others, um, is Canada thought about uh, in a sort of Indo Pacific lens um, from the United States? So, is there, is there ways that the um, United States is trying to work with Canada or open to working with Canada um, uh, more uh, in, in the Indo Pacific? Great. Well, thanks. Uh, really interesting discussion here on the Quad. And I, I would say the Quad is foundational in terms of the, the strategies in the Indo-Pacific and meeting the China challenge. Um, yes, there is this um, 
uh, tendency to uh, talk about you know the positive activities of the quad, um, but I think this this is good because uh, I think the the suspicions or the the negative reaction to the quad from the ASEAN countries is precisely they don't want to feel like they have to choose between the U.S. and China. So I think by focusing on uh, what the Quad is doing in terms of, you know, the vaccinations, uh, distributing 1 billion vaccinations by the end of 2022 to the ASEAN countries. Um, this is something which shows the value of the Quad and the four, you know, powerful democracies working together uh, for positive initiatives in the region. But let's be clear, the, the um, it is also about uh, maintaining norms in the Indo-Pacific as we see China trying to push against those norms. We can talk about you know territorial sovereignty and uh, some of the provocative moves we've seen by China. Um, these four powerful democracies coming together to stand up for a free and open uh, Pacific uh, Indo-Pacific is very powerful. So it's, it's, it's both, um, it's, um, trying to, you know, come together collectively to stand up against China, who's, who's trying to, uh, evade norms, um, and, uh, act more aggressively, but it's also, um, providing, you know, public goods to the region, uh, as well. And we have to remember the, the, the quad got its start really, um, following the 2004 tsunami, when by virtue of necessity, the four countries worked together uh, to, to deal with that crisis. And then it was former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe who really put the ideal ideological underpinnings behind the the idea of the quad and really try to push it in 2007. Um, but India and Australia at the time sort of backed away because they didn't want to provoke China. And it lay dormant for essentially 10 years. But I would say that, you know, if the idea is, well, we don't want to provoke China, we want to have a more cooperative relationship with China. Um, when the quad was dormant for 10 years, what happened? Well, you know, you didn't see a more cooperative China. You saw China pushing um, its territorial claims, um, you know, not to mention uh, the aggression on India's border. So I think that's why we see in the last year, year and a half, India being a lot more receptive to the Quad, where it was being very cautious because it realizes that the cautious approach didn't really buy it anything in terms of um, more cooperation with the Chinese. Um, so I just put that out there. In terms of Canada's relationship with the Quad, absolutely. I think, again, the Quad is foundational, but particularly when it comes to the technology issues, the supply chain issues, the Quad can't deal with this um, on its own. There has to be interaction with not only Canada, but the European countries um, in looking at um, how, you know, all these democratic countries can decrease their dependency on China because they don't want to become victims of Chinese uh, economic coercion, like we saw with Australia, and also overly dependent on China in times of need, like we saw with COVID. Uh, so certainly there can be interactions from these other countries like Canada uh, with the Quad, uh, I would say that's necessary. So there, there's nothing stopping that. Thanks very much. These are very uh, helpful comments. Uh, very, very interesting and very useful. Uh, if I can move to Professor uh, Fukushima and uh, a, a couple of things that you mentioned during your um, your presentation, which I really enjoyed. Uh, and number one, you referenced uh, the sort of the blueprint of how Canada is now. Uh, without having a strategy out yet, uh, the early indications of how we might be approaching this region, I think, came last month through our foreign ministers meeting uh, with Japan and our sort of six point outline uh, on areas that we're interested in pursuing um, and to pursue a, a shared vision for the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, and those are not limited to the Japan relationship, but I think more broadly could be translated to uh, many of the partners that we will work with here. Um, so I think Japan is a really good hinge point and touch point for us to potentially uh, work off, whether it's you know whether it's in the quad context or whether it's in other sort of trilaterals. Um, some of the only minilaterals that we have been engaging in this region actually have been hinged off Japan. 
uh, we've had uh, trilateral exercises um, with the United States, uh, Japan, and uh, the Canadian forces. Uh, so that's one example. But I think there's other opportunities that we could work with uh, with Japan. So you know, interested in your thoughts on this discussion, and also sort of to give you that question that I gave Garima. Uh, again, you think of uh, former Prime Minister Abe as uh, as one of the key um, sort of intellectual grandfathers uh, of of this uh, Indo-Pacific concept. Um, we have a new uh, administration now in Japan, um, and we don't know how long that administration will last for. Um, but it seems to me anyways that this Indo-Pacific uh, concept and idea, there's been a lot of consistency, status quo, not a whole lot has changed in the Suga administration. Uh, but do you see this going forward as something that uh, can be maintained, this sort of momentum and leadership that Japan has been putting forward on this, which I think in many ways has been very personally attached to uh, Abe Shinzo? Sorry, you're on mute, uh, Professor. Yes, um, former Prime Minister Abe launched this concept of free and open uh, Indo-Pacific, but uh, in this case, it, uh, how should I say it in English, a transcended uh, individual and uh, Prime Minister Suga made it clear in his first press conference that he uh, will maintain and uh, enhance a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, initiative. And he is actually doing it in his uh, first uh, overseas trip to Southeast Asia. And uh, this year, uh, through uh, his uh, uh, online uh, Quad uh, Summit, as well as uh, his uh, summit meeting with President Biden, and uh, in the late, recent uh, G7, uh, Prime Minister Suga continued to push this free and open Indo-Pacific initiative. And he is trying to uh, cooperate with other countries who share uh, interest uh, together. And uh, as uh, Foreign Minister Motegi made it clear, uh, Japan is uh, willing to work with uh, countries who shares uh, uh, interest and uh, concern to work with. And Canada, of course, is uh, one of those uh, groups. And uh, as uh, colleagues have already mentioned, uh, the latest uh, online Quad Summit issued a statement called Spirit of Quad. And it, co it contained a uh, rule of law portion, which is very important uh, uh, for Japan, uh, given the situations uh, in uh, East China Sea, and also uh, other elements which uh, Garima have uh, mentioned, like uh, vaccination, uh, critical technology, climate change, and others, as an area to cooperate. So Quad, in a sense, have a uh, uh, multifaceted uh, face, and for these uh, functional uh, agenda, uh, it cannot stay within the limit of, or perimeter of Quad, but has to involve others. And Prime Minister Suga made it, uh, made an effort to make a wording uh, more inclusive, like in the case of vaccination, uh, even to ASEAN and beyond. So it doesn't limit, Japan at least doesn't want to limit uh, the discussions to uh, among the three for, but when uh, the topic uh, is uh, relevant to other countries, it also include and have uh, scope to be expanded. That's how Prime Minister Suga uh, drives this uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, on the side note, there are some rumors when he uh, assume the post of the Prime Minister. Prime Minister Suga may uh, wish to change the concept from free and open in the Pacific to safe and pro prosperous or something else, but uh, it didn't happen. And he keeps uh, his firm grip on free and open in the Pacific. It seems adjectives mean a lot here. Thanks very much, Professor. Yeah, I think we're we're all getting used to that acronym, as uh, clumsy as the FOIP or FOIP can be. So we don't need any more acronyms. We like uh, we like what we know. Uh, uh, so that's great to hear. Um, thank you so much. Now let's move to Margaret, and then uh, we're going to move into the audience questions because I think we're, we're we're running a bit short on time. Margaret, there's been a lot of great insights from a lot of your panelists on on how they've been approaching this, and I know I've been taking a lot of notes, thinking about. 
uh, how this can uh, impact Canada and how uh, how we might look at this. And I think fundamentally, I mean, we've been talking about the Quad, but really what we're talking about here is vehicles of engagement, um, whether that's um, di different minilateral issue-based coalitions, as Garima, I think, mentioned, uh, or multilateral institutions, I think, as Frederick kind of uh, touched on with ASEAN. And clearly, I think Canada has uh, uh, had most of its attention focused on the latter traditionally uh, being an ARF uh, uh, founding dialogue partner and um, obviously member of the ADB, et cetera. Um, how do you sort of see this landscape playing out for Canada in the coming years? Do we need to be taking a more of a balanced approach of, of course, keeping our, our centrality focused on our, our relationship with ASEAN and hopefully getting into a few more of the clubs, uh, East Asia Summit and ADMM Plus, uh, but also at the same time uh, looking to pursue some of our interests in the in the mini lateral space. Uh, how do you see this uh, playing out, Margaret? Well, I, I see it playing out really to our strengths uh, because Canada is known uh, for its uh, unique constructive contributions to engagement. So it's not in your face leadership. It's uh, a more subtle leadership, such as the Declaration on Arbitrary Detention, which we led uh, over the past uh, recent months. And, uh, and, and, you know, collaborations on uh, advanced technology, I think, are really key to this. We're doing uh, several reviews now in Canada about our collaborations with China on um, by, by some of our researchers who in AI and biotech and advanced materials have been uh, inadvertently uh, collaborating with um, Chinese military researchers and uh, Chinese surveillance companies. And so there's a, a, a federal review and a provincial review going on um, based very much on the stellar work of ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, and so, researchers are going to want to look for um, turning to other partners uh, as they find that you know these these military partners in China are, are not really viable for the long term. And so we have a lot to offer um, and also on the supporting uh, structure for uh, advanced technology, which is the rare earths, which they really rely on. Uh, so cobalt, lithium, and other rare earths, which we have a lot of in Canada. Uh, up until now, the cost for processing has been high, but that's now changing. And so I see us contributing also in that area. That's fantastic. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so I'm going to go uh, move to the audience questions, and a lot of them sort of overlap with some of the ideas that, uh, that I was wanting to discuss too, so I think this works out well. Um, and I think we only have time for probably one last one um, yeah, for very quick thoughts on, and I mean, this is a, a classic, uh, not only Canadian foreign policy issue uh, in question that you'll hear, but one that you'll hear in many of these different forums when talking about the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific security issues, um, is so one of the audience questions asks, where do you see um, a middle power diplomacy uh, in the Indo-Pacific during the emerging uh, great power competition between uh, China and the United States? And I think obviously uh, hatched onto that will be very specifically some of the countries that we're talking about today. I mean, Canada, this is a, a question that has been asked quite a bit as we've uh, struggled with some of the challenges in our relationship with China recently. Um, one thing that I would like to uh, note, and I think this is definitely the case in the Canadian example, is middle power and middle power diplomacy shouldn't really necessarily be um, confused with uh, non-aligned or the idea that, that we don't have sides. I think uh, clearly in this discussion, there are sides, there are interests, there are values that we align more closely to. Uh, so often when I hear this discussion of, you know, we don't want to be stuck in the middle between US and China, uh, you know, we have one border, one geographic border, it's the United States, we have a longstanding uh, trade, uh, you know, it's not a perfect relationship, uh, but it's a very, very good relationship and there's much we share there. So we, we can't confuse it to the idea that it's uh, you know two equal sides and that we don't want to be stuck in between. And I think that's not just true for Canada, but that's true for a lot of states in this region. Um, so it's not a simple binary choice. Uh, but that being said, I think it is a fair question that you know how are states in this region uh, looking to navigate this? I think we've talked about a few of these different uh, vehicles of engagement uh, that can try to sort of maintain this course in between that. But I'd like to see, get your thoughts on this, uh, uh, you know, how, how states can uh, navigate this course. So if I can uh, start uh, with Lisa maybe this time, uh, and then we can uh, make our way. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think the one of the audience questions was talking about 
uh, norms and standards and, and how can we do that uh, in, in the midst of great power competition, which I think gets at what you're saying, you know, how can a country like Canada be involved? Um, and I think when we're talking about norms and standards, I'd like to talk about two, two issues. One is norms with regard to territorial sovereignty, um, you know, and, and in this way, uh, some of the ways we do that, freedom of navigation operations, um, joint sales that, you know, we do with multiple countries, um, working together on maritime security. Uh, so I think, you know, that that's one issue where um, any country who wants to continue to see freedom of the seas and countries be able to maintain their uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty um, can can collaborate on. And the second one, and I talked about this earlier, is norms with regard to digital development. We see China um, taking a major role in developing the digital ecosystems in the ASEAN countries, for example. And I think, you know, setting the norms and standards for how that development happens and then, you know, working with uh, both the governments and the civil societies in these countries so that they can, you know, uh, monitor their their own security uh, in the developing of these uh, digital ecosystems, as well as norms and standards with regard to the use of these um, digital technologies so that they're used in a way that they're protecting individual liberty, privacy, et cetera. So I think Canada has a huge role to play in setting these norms and standards, uh, particularly when it comes to digital development, um, but also in in the maritime security realm uh, as well. Uh, so that that would be my suggestion for uh, Canada's role. Many thanks, Lisa. That's a really excellent point, uh, Professor Fukushima. If I could have some of your thoughts on this, uh, very briefly, if you, if not, if possible. Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, I concur with Lisa's point. Uh, so that's my short uh, response, but let me expand a bit. Uh, Canada, and as a matter of fact, others uh, have to play a role of uh, norm entrepreneur. Uh, for example, in digital or critical technology and new fields, we have to uh, set up uh, new standards and new uh, norms and rules. And for doing that, when you have a larger market share, you may have a larger voice. And a single country cannot uh, determine international standards. And if we allow the situation, we may end up with the dual or parallel standards. And that would not uh, do us uh, justice in terms of economy. So regardless of the size of a power, I think it is this is a time that we have to change our mindset and be uh, forthcoming in setting norms and standards. Uh, ter territorial integrity and sovereignty is also another uh, norms or rules that I would like to defend. Final point. Uh, I have worked on multilateralism for long, as you know, and uh, I have a strong feeling on it. Uh, and now people are saying uh, with the hashtag multilateralism matters, which I uh, welcome. However, I have a, one caution that I would like to share with you. Multilateralism should not be used as a cover to pursue one's national interest. Let me stop there. That's a great point. I haven't seen that hashtag. I guess I'm not on Twitter enough, but that's uh, it's really, really interesting. Uh, Frederick, uh, can I move to you quickly on this? Yeah, thank you so much. I like multilateralism matters hashtag. I'm going to copy that. Um, the, um, uh, the So on the bit, sometimes I find the discussion about whether we are moving towards a new uh, block situation or Cold War or something is, 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 is quite often rejected as almost ridiculed, right? And I, I find this a bit exaggerated. So I I think this is hiding what is actually going on and where we are moving to here in this region. And it very much feels like we are supposed to choose very, very soon. And yet, what makes it different, the current situation from what we perhaps associate with the Cold War is precisely this, right? This middle power agency, the agency by 
a large number of significant others, perhaps if you want to call it like that, without being being um, being disrespectful, to 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 engage in norm setting and standard setting. And it's, of course, from a European perspective, two things come to mind. Of course, one is um, setting norms on trade, on trade and supply chains, which is something that the European Union is currently uh, rolling out, right? And, uh, particular with laws on supply chains, in fact. Uh, and the other thing is human rights, right? Keeping up um, uh, pressure on, on specific countries uh, within their means to maintain at least a minimum standard of what the international community, if there is even such a thing, would would accept as um, and would see as an acceptable standard of human rights, right? So I think, um, and, and, and if you play this through all the different so-called "Quote unquote middle powers, right? You will find that different different players in that in that category can bring different things uh, to the table, and this includes Canada, of course. This includes Japan, Australia, and so forth. And we all have our different strengths. And I think this is really what makes this situation a lot more dynamic. While I think we are moving towards some sort of block-ish situation, uh, this really this dynamic uh, um, um, ignited by the middle powers is really what makes the situation different through it, and also what gives me some sort of hope to end on a very positive note. Thank you. That's always welcome. Uh, Valerie, uh, uh, if I can move to you, I'm not sure France considers it uh, a middle power, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, uh, this question. Sorry, Valerie, you're on mute. Saying a fading middle power. So <laughs> with a lot of ambitions. Uh, but uh, but uh, justifiably, I would say, because uh, when you look at what is done in terms of uh, security, in including in the Indo-Pacific, uh, France, uh, I must say, is uh, one of the only country that still manages to invest its in a defense budget, for instance, some capacity to project, as was uh, demonstrated, and it might uh, to, seem to be too arrogant to some of our partners that uh, France is still has the ambition to play that kind of role in the Indo-Pacific, but I think it is useful and it's a useful basis for discussion also with our partners everywhere, uh, in the US of course, uh, but also partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific, including Japan, India, and others that I mentioned before. And uh, when you uh, when we we talk about values and norms, this is something, of course, that we can share between the EU, which is uh, wants itself to be perceived as a normative power, uh, especially on human rights issue, and also Japan, for instance, as that kind of uh, the same kind of uh, posture. So I think this is a very important point. Um, but uh, um, actually, there is another uh, way to connect everything is that, uh, uh, you know, the quality investments uh, concept that uh, Japan also is very keen to, to focus on. Uh, and it relates also in Europe to the connectivity uh, concept. And once again, we can say, okay, let's not mention the C word, word but uh, everyone, everybody knows that when you mention norms, uh, respect for, you know, avoiding debt trap, uh, real development and not uh, final, I, I'm thinking it's a little bit far away, but no, uh, Africa, for instance, where you have a good, I mean, China is very much there, but it's very, China is very much there in Africa at the level of the elite, you know, and often it is based on special, uh, Gwansi, how do you say, in, um, in um, networks or, you know, Corruption, maybe sometimes. I'm not sure at the civil society level it, it is that uh, important. But uh, China can have, uh, may have a destabilizing and very dangerous consequences on the stability of the African con continent, where you know France is very much involved in terms of security. So all these things also relate, I mean, values development, quality infrastructures, connectivity, and this is something on which uh, I think Europe, other Asian countries can, and capacity building to uh, is uh, uh, all these things on Canada, of course. I mean, um, all these things are connected and useful to build uh, some kind of uh, discussion, but without delusion about what is the real issue at stake. 
Okay, thanks very much. Okay, uh, Garima and Margaret, uh, you you both have the last uh, words, uh, and then uh, very briefly, please, and then we're going to uh, end up. So, Garima, please, you're first. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep my intervention quite brief. Um, Rory Metcalf, in his seminal work on the Indo-Pacific, talks about the agency of middle powers and how middle power coalitions is exactly the driving force behind the emergence of this idea. Um, a lot has been said on norms, on technology, trade, etc. But I think um, middle powers working together to provide alternatives, public goods, building capacities, and support for other countries so that when certain countries can be deterred to sort of deterred if they are breaking rules and norms, uh, whether it be China or whether it be some other country, I think those those are important trends to follow. Um, for Canada, would be interesting, I think, as an example to see how Europe is working, particularly with India. Uh, for for Canadian policymakers who are interested in the Indo-Pacific, I would point you to the recent Europe-India summit which follows exactly these things of providing alternatives, building capacities, talking about new norms, particularly norms of um, digital uh, connectivity, data, um, also cooperation in AI. Those are very interesting. And that is one partnership that is completely shifted under the Indo-Pacific lens. Uh, so that could be an interesting thing. And since, I mean, this is my day job and I, I didn't bring it up this whole webinar, so I want to end it with, with mentioning just this bit. Thanks. Thanks so much, Karima. Uh, Margaret, you have the last word. Well, one of the messages that China has been delivering to from Beijing to Ottawa behind closed doors is that Canada is not a middle power. Canada is a small power and has to stop leaning towards the US, by which they mean we should lean more towards China. Um, of course, um, we're, we're always going to be best friends with our cousins south of the border. Um, and at the same time, uh, our most effective uh, role is always when we operate and, and collaborate with other middle powers, small powers, and large powers in multinational uh, organizations. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing a Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, I think it's going to be very exciting and will open many new doors for us. Thanks so much, Margaret. And I think uh, once this strategy hopefully comes out soon, uh, maybe the COVID-19 restrictions will be at a point where we can have you all back, uh, not not via Zoom, but uh, but in person and have a, have a longer discussion. I think uh, it's a really great discussion today. And I think uh, there's much more uh, ground that we could cover. Um, so let's hope that we can do that next time and have a conclave uh, in person. Um, we won't invite you to, to Canada in February, though. We'll try to make it in a, in a more acceptable uh, climate. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much again for everyone and, of course, to our audience for tuning in. Uh, this was a really fantastic discussion. I think it gives a lot of uh, meat on the bones for Canada to discuss uh, when thinking about uh, its own uh, Indo-Pacific approach. So thank you again to everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, uh, morning, afternoon, depending on where you've tuned in.